talk on food day. Food day was yesterday, though. 1024. The only reason why I know that is because I gave a talk to the Orange County Dietetic Association. And they, um, I talked to them about sustainability, too. So that's what I'm going to... I'm going to give you a talk on eating real. I know most of you have seen a lot of my lectures, and so this is different. I try to throw in a little something different about food, not necessarily food day related, but it might help you with cooking in the future. So, do you guys know what clean eating is? Yeah? So most people, the concept of clean eating is really a lifestyle. So, it's the way that you live. The more you look into clean eating, though, the more it seems like paleo. Because a lot of grains um, that we eat right now are refined. And so the only difference between the paleo diet and clean eating is that in clean eating, you want to eat carbs. You still want to have good carbohydrates in your diet. Whereas paleo, you try not to eat as many grains. You eat small meals five to six times a day. And that means three meals and then two snacks. And read labels. If you don't know what it is, you don't eat it. That's pretty simple. I feel like that's a concept that we've all been trying to follow. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you what some of the stuff is, so you'll start using it maybe. Um, use whole grains instead of refined, obviously. And try to buy local. Try to buy humanely raised meat and organic produce when possible. Very hard, though. Organically raised meat is something that you need to look into by yourself where the source is. You could ask the supermarket, but I can guarantee that about 80, 90% of them have no idea what the conditions are. They'll tell, them, they'll tell you it's great, but whether or not it is, you need to do the kind of investigation and look into it. PETA does a good job of trying to uh, bring awareness to certain farms that might not be doing as well, such as recently there was a foster farm salmonella outbreak, um, not necessarily having to do with, I don't know how they raise chickens. Apparently they raise them very well because everybody wants to be a foster farm chicken. But um, I don't know, uh, but I would definitely look into it. So eliminate all refined and artificial sugars. Refined sugars include granulated uh, sugars. But I will say one thing. Um, most, I have a friend who loves drinking Coke, regular Coca-Cola. And he has been drinking regular Coca-Cola in the U.S. his whole life. Well, he discovered Mexican Coca-Cola the other about six months ago. And he opened a whole new world to his taste buds. He had no idea Coke could taste so good. And the reason is the rest of the world uses regular sugar, just cane sugar. Whereas here in the U.S., for all of our sweet stuff, we're still stuck on corn syrup. And so because of that, Coke, Sprite, all those companies, I don't, I think Sierra Mist used cane sugar, real cane sugar, but most of them use corn syrup. So it tastes completely different. And I feel like our taste buds have adjusted to the corn syrup so much that we actually think it is sugar. And so our body tricks ourselves into thinking it is, but it's not. So go, if you want to drink your sodas, you can. Just make sure that you're drinking good sodas that have real sugar in it. And cook your own meals. So the history of clean eating, it's actually been around since the 1960s, during that natural health movement. But Michael Pollan was the one that recently brought it to our attention. So The Omnivore's Dilemma, um, what, uh, Food Rules is another great book. 64 Rules to Live By. Buy that book. If there's one book you buy this year, buy that book. It really, it's simple, these 64 rules. And those are some of the ones that he suggests. Eat only food that will eventually rot. That's really hard. Ketchup, if you notice, doesn't really rot unless you leave it out, put it back in, leave it out, and maybe somebody put a little spoon that had something on it, and finally mold begins to grow. So eat food that will mold or will go bad at some time. It's good for you if it does. It's real then. So that's clean eating. If it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. That's hard. That's very hard. Don't eat anything your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. That great-grandmother, I would maybe even go as far as great-great-grandmother. Um, avoid food products that can't contain more than five ingredients. That's really, really hard. Because if you think about it, salt and pepper are already two. That leaves you with three ingredients. Some people will say salt and pepper don't count, but if they do count, it's very, very, very hard. So I'll give you seven ingredients. You can add the salt and pepper, 
but try and look at the labels and see how many ingredients are actually in there. And the reasons to eat whole foods, obviously, phytochemicals, the nutrient shortages that we have in most of our diet, like the shortage of vitamin C. Um, and we get definitely too little vitamin A. So look for those things that would supplement those nutrient shortages that are, we find in our foods. Good fats. So you can increase whole food, uh, increasing whole foods reduces the need for you to, increases your intake of good fats. And good fats are obviously better for your health, your heart, diabetes, and things like that. And fiber. Definitely helps you feel fuller, faster, and it makes everything nice and smooth <coughs> down there for you. So, sample daily cleaning, clean eating meal. This is not a cleanse, but if you look at it, oops, sorry. If you look at that, you will actually feel like it's really hard. And it's, it is. This clean eating isn't easy. And the main reason is because of the way that we've made convenience food such a part of our normal day-to-day -day lives that we feel like it's okay that we go and buy a microwaveable food. So if you look at that, what you'll notice is that there's always a carbohydrate, a fruit or vegetable, and then a protein of some sort. Clean eating requires all three of these in every single meal. So you can't do the Atkins on this because you do need your carbohydrates. The idea of eating a complete meal will keep you energized for the rest of the day and help you do what you need to do. So a smoothie, obviously you would maybe add protein powder to the smoothie if you want, um, or you can find other ways of adding protein into your breakfast. Or you can switch snack one with, snack, uh, with the breakfast. So simple substitutes, sugar, you've got honey, agave, maple sugar, date sugar. Date sugar I've talked about once, I think, if you take dates and dry them out in the oven, low, low temperature for a long, long time, like six to eight hours at like a 250, they get kind of dry, they dry out. And then you just stick it in your food processor and blend it, and then you've got sugar. It's a little moist. It doesn't work like regular sugar would in your baked goods, but it is, gives you that sweetness that you need. Stevia is the one that we've all been turning to, but I have to warn you guys, stevia does, I, for your digestive tract, it's not exactly um, something that we're used to having. So start in small amounts and gradually increase your stevia use if you do, but it, it, our bodies have a hard time digesting it. White flour, you barley, rice, oats, felt. Um, I use brown rice flour today for the gluten-free breadsticks. And on protein, your egg whites, tenderloins of any animal. Chicken, beef, pork. Chicken, beef, pork, yeah, that's it. Chicken, beef, pork, all three of those, and turkey. The tenderloin has the, it's the softest, most tender part of the animal, if you do eat meat, and it has no fat in it. So if you like beef, beef tenderloin is filet mignon. It's the same thing. You can eat, order that filet, just make sure they're not adding all that butter on top of it before you eat it. But the filet mignon is actually one of the leanest pieces of meat that you can buy, too. Um, if it's not marble like crazy, so it depends on where the source of the beef is too. So carbs, fruit and cottage cheese, hummus and veggies, hummus would be more of a protein, but oh no, this is, oh no, sorry, I added the, didn't take away the dinner and the snack, sorry about that. So eating clean when you eat out. Mexican, I know we don't like saying soft homemade shells. You shouldn't be eating them, but if you were to go out, go for the soft shells as opposed to the crunchy ones because they've been fried. The Asian go for steamed rice, steamed vegetables. You can ask them to grill stuff with you. Ponzu or soy sauce are your two choices for sauces. And then Wendy's and McDonald's are baked potatoes and chives, salads, no dressing. It sounds very bland, but this is the way to eat if you do want to be more healthy. And ask. You can take the bruschetta from the menu and put it on top of your chicken, or ask them to make this into that for you. Most places will do it for you if it's a sit-down restaurant. Um, there are obviously places that won't do it, but just ask, it doesn't hurt. And uh, this is the fun part. So I wanted to show you guys that cooking is not that hard. But I want you to understand how we eat as humans, and this is the flavor pyramid. The flavor pyramid explains how we split our eating habits into these sections. What we eat based off the most is emotions. 
as humans, we eat based off emotions the most. So what you grew up eating really does make a difference on what you eat right now. So what makes you happy? For example, bread might make you happy, but you can't eat bread anymore. So what do you do? So that's why I gave you a gluten-free option. So there's always an option, but I wanted you to understand that the basic tastes are at the very top. They matter the least to our whole when we're cooking. It's more about the motions and the appearance of the food, and then comes the aromas, then the textures, then the sensations, and then our taste. So it's really interesting how that's how we usually eat. So there's a difference between seasoning food and flavoring food. Seasoning is by adding salt and things like that. Flavoring is actually creating, making you feel a certain way because of the way that you're eating it. So it might be eating spaghetti in a large bowl or eating something, a large amount of food on a small plate to make you feel like you've actually eaten more. So there's different ways to make yourself feel like you're getting more flavors out of something, not necessarily by seasoning it too. So there's a difference between the two. Most common flavors, obviously acids, liqueurs, herbs, spices, sweet seeds and nuts, and sugars and then other things like liquid smoke, Worcestershire sauce, which I would not suggest you use. But this is, these are where we get most of our flavors from. Worcestershire sauce, because of the amount of chemicals in it. Most of it has a lot of preservatives in it. If you want to use Worcestershire sauce, anchovies and soy sauce. I would do a combination of that. But it's really a lot of an yeah, anchovies and Worcestershire sauce, but it's not vegetarian for those who didn't know. So yeah. And it also, yeah, an acid of some sort. So maybe like a lemon or a lime. So yeah, you can make your own. Okay, so cooking to create flavor, searing, these are all the different ways. So th these are all different ways of cooking to get flavor. The ones that you should stay away from are obviously fried. Um, and you should stick with steaming and stewing. But each of these different ways of cooking creates a different flavor profile in your food. Um, and so choose whichever one you like, but at the same time realize that there's different you'll get different results out of it. Eight simple ways to build flavors. I'm gonna put them all up so sear or broil meat, deglaze the pan with stock. If you've ever cooked with a pan and you can't clean it out, just grab your cheapest bottle of white wine and pour away. Heat it up really, really hot and then just pour and scrape. That's only for stainless steel. Don't do it with a non-stick pan. You'll ruin your pan doing that. So don't do that with that. Even water works. As long as it's hot and there was oil in between the food and the pan, the water will go in between those molecules and separate them, making the sauce for you. So you can technically use water. But you need to have heat, oil, and whatever was sticking on there. So those three components. Caramelized onion, easiest way. Start garlic or um, onions in cold oil, which I'll show you in a little bit. Toast spices and nuts in a pan or oven, reduce sauces. Adding salt, sugar, or acid can help enhance flavors, poaching, and slow cooking. I am also going to say that if you really want an umami flavor, and if you guys don't know what that is, it's that complete flavor. So umami is supposed to have all of the sour, sweet, and all of that. But if you talk to somebody in Japan, umami does not mean that. Umami means add MSG into your food. So <laughs> that really is what it means. And so if you want umami flavors, try a little MSG, and it'll make that flavor for you. I, MSG is, oh, and roasting. MSG is really up to the personal preference, in my opinion. So what is sustainable eating? You need to choose your food based on where it came from. So I know this group has probably heard me talk about the quinoa root. It's a very long one, and we're just we're not being very nice to the people who do eat it because we're paying a lot of money for it and they can't afford it anymore. So if you do buy quinoa, try to find a local um, fair trade is a good brand um, or anything with a fair trade sticker on it. And when something is sustainable, it can support itself. So if you grew an apple tree in Alaska, it should be able to sustain itself, or an orange tree in Alaska. So obviously, it probably can't in the middle of winter, an uh, orange tree in Alaska, unless it's in a nice greenhouse or so on. But think about what you're buying before you actually buy it. We're lucky. We have, we're in California. But I will say all the cheap produce that we buy, 
the cheap produce that we buy from, like Wholesome Choice or even Trader Joe's, most of it is from Mexico. The great thing you want local and you want a store to buy it in, Sprouts is probably your best bet. Yeah, Sprouts is the one that I know. Or Growers Direct. Growers Direct tries really, really hard in Costa Mesa. So, um, it's sustainable, it's healthy, it doesn't harm the environment, it provides farmers with a fair wage, farm, farm labor and fair wage laws are taken care of and respects farm animals and supports and preserves rural communities. Um, so I'm going to go into the recipe that I made. And we are on soup these days. It's a good day for soup. So for the minestrone soup, it's pretty easy. Minestrone is one of those things where um, it's really hard to mess up on. The only thing you can mess up on is how or what kind of ingredients you want to add inside. So I added, I have cabbage in there, onion, garlic, and all those great things. I like adding cabbage. It's not necessarily something you always see, uh, but I like it just because it gives it the cruciferous. Cruciferous gives you different types of benefits as opposed to other veggies. Um, so onions, when you buy onions, um, just make sure, these are the onions that they're selling at the store right now. They're huge. So an onion this big actually ha doesn't have as much flavor. If you've ever bought larger, the larger the thing is, it usually doesn't have as much flavor. One other ingredient that you can add in here is um, zucchini. And for zucchini, what I can suggest you do is never, ever buy a zucchini that's longer than six inches long, ever. You will hate yourself. Zucchinis tend to become spongy if you, they go larger than four to six inches. So I'm going to just peel this guy. It was in the refrigerator, so that's why it's hard to peel. So I cut off one end, and then I chop away. So there we go. So I keep the root intact, and then I cut down. And then I'm just going to make cuts on the top. The blade of this knife is about the size of the onion, how big the onion is. Claw my hand. I've got my fingers ready, and I'm going to chop it. Onions, you can't. Chopped onions will stink up your refrigerator really badly, almost worse than garlic in my opinion. So what I say, if you really like onions and you need it in your food, instead of storing it chopped already, what you should do is store it cooked. So either cook some up and then store it, or try to only, try to chop up to this point, wrap it in saran wrap, and then put it in the refrigerator. Once you let those juices out, the smells will go all over your refrigerator. So I'm going to add my onions in. And you can add however much. There's no rules to this dish at all. Up to you. But I will say one thing. I did use no salt, um, no salt added tomatoes and so on. But I did add something in there that you probably wouldn't add on your own, and that's white orzo. So I added a white pasta inside of there, whereas you might use like a whole wheat. Um, Israeli couscous is really good. You can use like a whole wheat bulgur, a bulgur wheat, something like that. But you can use something different. It doesn't have to be, or you, you can use brown rice, but you can use anything you want. I use canned tomatoes, but tomatoes in the summer, if you really are interested, you can can your own. What you do is you take each plum tomato, and you should use plum or the Roma tomatoes, and to get the seeds out, what you do is you cut through the middle of it. So I opened it up this way. So this is where it grew out, and I cut it this way, and now I can go in and dig my seeds. But to peel them, have you guys ever peeled a tomato before? Yes, okay. To peel them, it's actually fun. Um, you can use a peeler. Any kind of peeler that has the little serrated edges, you can use to peel a tomato. Or what you do is you take your knife and you make a small incision just on the top, an X. And then you dunk it into boiling water. And quickly put it into ice water right after, and it'll peel right off. And then you can use it. And you can can them. Um, I like roasting tomatoes and then canning them, or jarring them, not canning them, but actually jarring them. 
So I'm just sauteing up my onions, and you would add garlic into here as well. And I'm just going to show you how to chop a cabbage up. So cabbage is one of those things that you can find year round, and I find that it's really good. There's so many types of cabbage too. So I'm just going to cut down the middle of it, come up here, and then I'm going to cut it into quarters, and then go diagonally and just chop. If you've never had, um, if you go to H Mart, there's Napa cabbage and then there's this American cabbage. There's also another cabbage that you'll find, huge head, they call it big head lettuce, or big head cabbage, and it comes about this big, and it's flat almost, it's a flat one. Buy it, it's really, really, really good. It's a Taiwanese cabbage. So no matter how long you cook it, it still has a crunch to it. It's more expensive, but it's, it retains its shape a lot better than any of the other cabbages that you can buy. So for example, Napa cabbage wilts down really easily. This cabbage is the kind that you would use inside like dumplings and things like that, and it gives you that bite still, no matter how fine you chop it or how much you cook it. So I'm just sauteing that up too. And then you're going to saute all your veggies up and then add stock. So you can use veggie stock, make your own veggie stock, or you can use like a concentrated. The ones that I suggest you buy, if you don't, it's a waste of money to go to Trader Joe's and buy their stocks. It's too much, it's cheap, I understand. But what's even cheaper is if you go to Smart and Final or any of the supermarkets, they have that better than uh, stock, that concentrated stuff. It's gluten free. So is Trader Joe's stuff, but it lasts a lot longer for the amount of money. Because usually what happens when you buy a quart of the stock, you don't usually use all of it. For soup, you probably would, but for a sauce, you wouldn't. So if you have that stuff laying around, you just whisk it in a little water, pour it into your sauce or whatever, and you're ready to go. So in this, I also added beans. I added red kidney beans, and if you are interested, these kidney beans, no salt, um, but all you have to do is soak them overnight and boil them for like an hour or two with whatever seasonings you might want, and you can add that to your soup too. And then the other thing that went with this was the pesto. So I made an arugula basil pesto to go with it all. And I just want to show you. So for the pesto portion of it, just go by yourself the bags of arugula from Trader Joe's if you want. And I want to tell you something. When you mortar a pest pestle, as opposed to using a food processor, you get a different flavor out of things. Using a mortar and pestle will give you more vibrant flavors in the sense that you're slowly grinding the flavors out, as opposed to a food processor that's just cutting. Food processor is just cutting things. A mortar and pestle is melding the flavors together. So try this pesto with a mortar and pestle. And so, and it doesn't have to be exact. If you have more basil one day than you do walnuts or whatever, go for it. It doesn't matter. So this is one of the, this is a cheapo mortar and pestle. This doesn't work as well as a nice uh, a nice like marble one. I'm just gonna grab a couple leaves of basil too. Stick those inside, and then cheese. And I use a combination of Asiago and Parmesan. Parmesan alone can be too much sometimes, and the Asiago has a creamier texture to it. So it makes a nicer pesto sometimes when you do it that way. And then garlic. And for the garlic, some people, if you don't like the taste of garlic, but you know other people do and want it in their pesto, Blanch it in a little bit of water. That's all it is. Just blanch it in water. Don't use, you can use roasted garlic, but I will tell you for this recipe, the amount of roasted garlic you would add is probably about three or four heads. You need that much for any flavor of garlic to actually come out. So I'm going to mortar and pestle this in a garlic. Frozen garlic would work. Yeah, frozen garlic would work really well too, because it doesn't have too much of a flavor to it. So I can't have my mortar right now. I would just, this comes with something, but what you do is you let the side of the bowls and the mortar do the work for you. So you're just going in there and mashing away. 
and you'll notice when you make pesto this way, try both ways, you'll notice a completely different flavor profile than when you do it the, uh, inside a food processor. Pesto freezes really well, so you can freeze it if you make a lot or store it in the refrigerator for about three to five days. You can probably get away with five days, but use it inside of a sauce or just toss it, boil some pasta up and just toss it in with the pesto. And that's it. Save some pasta water. Pasta water is your best friend whenever you're making pasta, by the way. It makes a sauce for you. You never actually need to make a sauce, but pasta water can make sauces really well for you too. So that's it for the pesto. It's a really good workout too. So if you have kids at home, anybody else can do this for you. I like my food processor too much sometimes. And you can use pine nuts. We don't use pine nuts a lot. Pine nuts are really, really, really expensive. Yeah, very, very expensive. So what I would say is if you like the take, it, I like pine nuts alone. Like they don't need to go into something with so much flavor because really all you're looking for is a nut and a crunch. So what I say is use like a walnut, you can even use almond if you want, throw in a couple of pine nuts, but make sure you toast them up so you get that really good flavor out of them. Um, but instead, serve it with some pine nuts on top or something like that. Don't put the pine nuts in. They're sometimes too good to be used that way. So next one is the, not the last one, but gluten-free breadsticks. So I have been on a craze, uh, gluten-free craze because everybody is gluten-free now. How many of you are gluten-free? No. Oh, you are, really? <laughs> no, you're paleo, that's what you, you are, I know you're paleo. So, gluten-free breadstick. I, the main reason why I did this was because I had Girl Scouts two days ago and they were all 10 years old and they were all gluten-free. I don't think they were all gluten-free, but the mom says they were all gluten-free. Um, and I want you to just look at this recipe. So it has pretty much the same ingredients that most most breads have, except for the flours and what will create the gluten for you. When you buy, when you use whole wheat flour or flours of any kind, uh -huh. gluten, there is nothing bad about gluten at all. No. Why do this? Because it's just a different way of eating bread. Um, a lot of people have just been asking, how do you make a gluten-free bread actually taste good? And so I thought I would show you how to do it because there's only one thing added into here that makes bread, that makes this bread. And that is your good old xanthan gum and guar gum right there. And there's the difference between xanthan gum and guar gum, I need you to know. Xanthan gum is a actual bacteria that they grow inside a lab on corn. <coughs> so if you can't have corn, you can't have anything with xanthan gum in it. Guar gum comes from a bean. It's a guar bean. And so it gives you a different te texture too. Both these things added into rice flour or tapioca starch and things like that help uh, give you that chew that gluten would. The other reason why, and now that she brought up why is, uh, why do we go gluten free? There's been, there have been studies, and John Hall's here, he's not around. There has been a study recently that came out that said that the wheat that we eat right now is completely different than the wheat that we ate a long time ago. It's been modified over time to the point where our bodies aren't digesting it like it used to. So, still up in the air, I'm not a nutritionist, I don't do any of that, but I do teach you how to make something gluten-free if you want. So, that's why. So we're using active, we're using yeast, and I just wanna show you what it looks like afterwards, because it's actually really, really, weird and I'm kind of funky and a lot of people who won't know what to do with it once it gets to that point. And the other thing is, um, yeah, not most people don't have celiac too. That's a misconception that a lot of people have that are gluten free. Um, but I still find it's important for you guys to learn a little bit of everything. So brown rice flour, I'm gonna add in here. And yeah, you probably, this is, Bob's doesn't even make it organic. You probably want to buy an organic brown rice flour as to just a regular brown rice flour. And a tapioca starch. Tapioca starch you, or tapioca flour, same thing you can find inside um, any of the Asian supermarkets. Because it's something that they use as a thickener for a lot of stuff. So all of that gets put in here. And then warm water, xanthan gum. Xanthan gum is expensive. A small package will cost you about $12.99. So yeah, it's not cheap stuff. 
Quorum gum, same thing. So I use both interchangeably if you want. It's up to you which one you like. For this recipe, I will be honest, xanthan gum tastes better. But the guar gum still gives you that kind of texture that you're looking for if you are. So all of that gets mixed together. And then you're also going to add apple cider vinegar, agave, and warm water. The reason why you add the agave is because you have yeast in there and you want to activate the yeast. And then the vinegar just helps everything bind together too. So I'm going to add a little bit of that. to mix, uh, to feel the temperature of the water because you don't want it to be too cold, uh, you don't want it to be too hot. It's cold is okay, but if it's too hot, you'll kill your yeast before you actually are able to use it. So I'm just mixing it together. You can do this in a mixer if you want, completely up to you. But you're adding water into starches that have no gluten and therefore they just absorb it. It just starts sucking it up dry. And you're adding a lot of water, so this dough is actually quite wet. And what's funny is when you're making this, the yeast doesn't dissolve like it does when you make other broths. Kind of, you can feel each gra grain of yeast that's left in there. Uh huh. No, you don't. You can make this completely in a bowl like this, and it can look like that, and you'll still be completely okay. So, if you notice, it doesn't stay together. It's kind of loose. It's not a dough that wants to like come together. Well, it does want to come together, but then it's too sticky, and you wonder, what am I supposed to do at this point? There's a couple of things that you do. You use white rice flour, which is significant. Use white rice flour, which is a lot cheaper than the other stuff, the brown rice flour, and you just dust your area. Take your dough, wash your hands before you do this too, because it's just it doesn't want to get off sometimes. And then just roll it gently in that. And then roll it into whatever shape you want. If you're making a big batch of this, all of it needs to be about the same size or else they won't bake out correctly. And that's it. And then you can cut this in half. And then before you put it into the oven, you see how it's white like that? Before you put it into the oven, make sure you brush off the extra flour, brush it with a little bit of oil, and then put on your topping. So you can add, you can even make a focaccia out of this if you wanted to. It's a very easy dough to work with once you know what it is that you're looking for. It's confusing in the beginning because it looks like such a mess. But I'll leave that out there so that you guys can see. And then the last thing I'm going to show you is how to make your own apple juice. You guys, has anybody ever made their own apple juice before? Yeah? With, with, with that. Oh, you made it. That's cool. So I wanted to tell you that making your own apple juice is super easy. All you do is you grab some apples, cover it with water, and then bring it up to a boil. And then it's going to become this kind of, this only, I would say it takes maybe 15 minutes on a large boil. And you want a little bit of water in there because that's where you're going to get your juice from. But you can put your peels, you can put your corn, everything in there. The only thing you don't want in there are the seeds. So if you collect like peels from apples, store them all together in the freezer in a bag, and then make a big thing of apple juice whenever you're ready. And then all you're going to do is strain it. And this might take a little bit more time just because there's so much fiber inside of apples. So you're just going to press it out. And then you got your filtered, unfiltered apple juice. I don't really know if this would be considered filtered or not. And you would need to can it or drink it right away. Don't let this sit around for more than like five days. Then you take this and you make jello out of it. So uh, I just need this just really quickly. Jello is made with gelatin most of the time. If you are a vegetarian, you cannot have jello. Um, if you are. <coughs> If you like gummy bears, the good gummy bears, the Caribou ones, 
those have gelatin in them too. So if you're a vegetarian, you should not be eating those. Um, because gelatin, if we're a lot of, do most of you guys know where gelatin is from? Yeah. Horses, food, food. I've been to a chicken, uh, chicken factory once and they have a vat and they collect feet and beaks. And then they sell that vat of just random trimmings of beaks and feet to companies that make gelatin and women's cosmetic company. Number one, number one buyers of their stuff. Yep, lipstick, oh, that's all in there. So all of that is in there. So what do you do if you can't have it? You use what we call agar agar. And if you look up there, there's the fresh form on the top right side, it's a seaweed. And then on the bottom left, that's actually the dry form that you can buy. And I buy it in an even better form called powder. So they make it into powder for you. It does not, it's not gelatin. When you eat jello, you know how it's almost like a creamy texture that you get that coats your mouth. You can't get this with that. This gelat, it makes things come together, but there's more of a crunch almost, or a little more of a bite when you eat, when you make anything with agar agar. So for agar agar, all you're gonna do is you're gonna take your juice and you're gonna boil it and then dissolve this inside. You need to make sure it completely dissolves because if it doesn't, you'll get chunks of parts that are solid and others that aren't. It needs to be brought back up to a boil, and then you just pour it into whatever mold you want. And you can use any juice. You can use orange juice, apple juice. Um, I've had really good success with the unfiltered apple juices from any, from Whole Foods, from uh, Trader Joe's, any of them. So, I mean, yeah. I use Granny's for this. You can use anything. Try to go for something sweeter if you like sweet things. And then if anything, you can add sugar into it. Um, you can add sugar or you can use honey, agave, really anything that you want. This is the uh, apple juice. And then you can add nutmeg, cinnamon into it and then just put it into a coffee liner and you're ready to go.